This is a nice little scan of a Nintendo Switch controller. I made this a couple of months ago when I was experimenting with a low-budget scanner, the Seal Pro. Considering how little the scanner cost, the result is quite good. However, this is not a final production asset. To have one that can be used in a real-world project, we need better geometry, defined details, individual pieces we can move and animate around. Basically, we need to create an entirely new model. So, how do we go about doing that? Since we have the scan, it's a really simple process. We only need basic modeling skills. The tools we have nowadays make the process very easy. It's tedious, but it's easy. So, in this video, we'll go through that process, but this time we'll use Cinema 4D instead of ZBrush. So, let's get started. The first step before going through the modeling process is making sure that the imported scan is level and zeroed out to the center of the world. This will make our lives easier later on, since we won't have to fight with weird angles or with parts that don't quite fit symmetrically. I know it's an annoying step, but don't rush it. Take your time and double and triple check that everything looks correct. Take it from me, even though I made sure to level everything out, I still missed a slight rotation on the Z axis. It's not the end of the world, you can still model things fine, but it was annoying to deal with when things didn't exactly match the scan, so I had to improvise a little bit. There are several ways to model something like this. That's one of the benefits of using modern software. So even though I'll show you my approach, it doesn't mean it's the way to do it. Just grab the bits and pieces you like and disregard the parts that don't necessarily fit your workflow. So let's have a closer look at our object. The overall shape looks simple. However, there are some tricky surfaces there. For example, the handles. From the top view, it doesn't look that difficult. It looks curvy, but in reality, only parts of it are. The sides, for example, are flatter. And the same goes for the top, where all the controls are. It's not an entirely flat surface. Furthermore, the shape of the handles goes in all sorts of directions. From the sides, it slopes downwards, but only part of it. And if we check the back, the shape is curving inwards and outwards. It's actually a more complex shape than it looks. So for me, this is the perfect use case for Cinema's Polygon Pen. Once we enable the Reproject option, we can very closely follow the scan. We can move and adjust the geometry, and Cinema will ensure that our polygons and points will stick to the underlying surface. <laughs> Basically, there's no way for us to mess up the shape. To model the handle, I divide it into smaller segments. I first deal with the top, curvier surface, then the flatter sides, and finally the curvier bottom. As you can see, the process is not really that complicated. It's just a matter of creating new edges and stitching things together. To create a new edge, we just hold down the command or control key for PC and drag, and that's it. If you move a point or an edge closer to another point or edge, it will merge them together. It's a really intuitive tool. The one annoying thing which you will encounter quite a bit has to do with random connections to points or edges you weren't intending to. This happens to me all the time, and in most cases you can't avoid it. It just has to do with how the tool works. Enabling backface calling in the viewport preferences sometimes helps, but not always. It depends on the shape and the view of the camera. It's nothing too bad, but it did have to go back in some areas and fix the random connections that occurred. Since the controller is relatively symmetrical, creating the left handle is just a matter of throwing the shape into symmetry and calling it done. That's where you can see that my alignment was slightly off. I could have fixed it at that point, <laughs> but I did not. I just moved along to modeling the top surface of the joystick. I know. <laughs> Even though the real-world surfaces are separate pieces, I still wanted to make sure that everything flows correctly. So I'm closely following the topology of the handles. I'm trying to use as few polygons as possible because it makes things much easier to adjust. In the end, subdivision surface will take care of making things nice and smooth. 
As for the hard edge surfaces, the process is really simple, they're just a couple of closely stacked knife cuts. With the main shape ready, it's time to now deal with all the holes for the buttons and the joysticks. I first go to the top view and define all these shapes with splines. The slightly trickier part was the d-pad, because for some reason the spline mask didn't want to join the splines into one shape. No matter the option, it just didn't want to work, so I ended up going about it in a roundabout way. With snapping enabled, I used polygon pen to snap to points, and once I had that shape, I then used the edge to spline command to get the spline I needed. And now with all the splines ready, I'm ready to project them to the surface. But this is the point where we have to strategize a little bit and think ahead. In order to project the splines, I need to break symmetry and also get rid of the subdivision surface. Since this will result in a dense mesh that's hard to edit, I need to make sure that the overall shape is completely done. And in order to do that, I have to have all the surrounding geometry around it done as well. So for now, we have to put the spline projection on hold until all the other pieces are modeled. So let's go ahead and start with the bottom and back pieces. These are modeled the same way as the handles and top, so I'm not going to bore you with all that footage. The only thing I'm going to highlight here is that I'm following the overall topology of the handle so that when the time comes, they all fit nicely together. And now that all the pieces are modeled, it's time for the tedious part. Endlessly moving points around until all the pieces fit. This is why I try to use the same topology for all parts. Notice that I haven't used any thickness yet. I'll add that later on, but for now it's just sliding points around. I would like to tell you that this is a very exciting and rewarding experience, but unfortunately it's not. The only thing that kept me going here is visualizing how good the final model could look. But that's about it. My motivation here was zero. But finally, after some 30 or so minutes, all the pieces fit nicely together. And now we're finally ready to cut out the splines. To make sure that the splines have enough detail to project to, I'm going to use a higher res mesh. I hit C to make it editable, and now we're good to go. For the projections, I'm going to use the line cut command. With the mesh selected and control key held down, if I click on a spline, Cinema will automatically project it and add it to the mesh. I'm using the top view to project the splines. Any other angle will mess up the final result. This process takes maybe 10 or 20 seconds in total. It's real quick. And the only thing left to do now is select the unwanted polygons and delete them. The mesh currently is not the cleanest, but this is where Cinema's remeshing comes into play. But for the tool to work best, we need to quickly modify a few things here and there. The cleaner the starting point, the better remeshing will be. The issue here is that there are a lot of unnecessary and closely clustered points, so the only thing I'm going to do here is either join points together with the help of a polygon pen or slide them around to move them away from each other. Remesh will then create a shape that very closely matches the original. There's one issue though with that final mesh, and that's polygon flow. For example, notice the area near the hard edge. If we want to accentuate it with a knife cut, we're going to have a hard time doing that because the flow is not the best for that situation. Thankfully, we can adjust it quite easily, and we do that by using splines as guides. I could have used a single spline for that area alone, but just to be on the safe side, I went ahead and used some more guides for all other parts of the mesh. That's more <laughs> than was actually needed, but since it didn't hurt, I just rolled with it. The cool thing with Cinema's remeshing is that it's a generator, so we can easily iterate and find the right result without much fuss. We just drag the splines into the right field, and the mesh is automatically recalculated. And just like that, we have the flow we need for that area. Next up on the list is adding these small borders around the joysticks. These are incredibly easy to do. It's basically a loft object merged to the rest of the mesh. We will need some splines for that, and to get those, we're going to use the edge to spline command once more. That takes care of the base, but we also need the top part, which sits flush on the surface. 
That's easily done by scaling the points down on the Y axis. And now with all the splines at hand, we can make the loft object editable, merge it with the rest of the object by using the connect objects and delete command, and finally running the optimized command to get rid of the duplicate points on the base. And that's it, we're done. The process is exactly the same for the base of the second joystick, but I couldn't just reuse the mesh from the first one because the base sits on a completely different curved area. So I had to redo the whole thing, but it's nothing too difficult. The whole process takes maybe, I don't know, a couple of minutes, nothing too time consuming. Now that all the main shapes are complete, it's time to finalize them by adding some thickness. To do that, I'm going to use the old cloth surface trick. Basically, every shape will go underneath a cloth surface with just the thickness option enabled. I'm not going to use any subdivisions there at all. And then it's just a matter of adding the hard edges needed by making a couple of key knife cuts in the right places. The top part of the controller takes more time to finish up because it's not just the sides that need hard edges. Some of the holes require completely different treatment. For example, the holes for the plus and minus buttons have a slanted type of extrusion. So in this case, I need to first scale down the bottom loop and then add the necessary cuts. It's nothing too complex, it just takes time. But once this part is done, the rest of the main pieces go by fast. These ones just need a couple of knife cuts and they're good to go. I've approached the triggers the same way as all the other pieces. I'm using polygon pen to build a rough cage for each trigger. And then with a couple of knife cuts, I can get the hard edges on the specific areas that need them. Polygon pen is basically the ultimate cheat code in modeling. Most of the job is done for us automatically, which is perfect for this type of work. I would say the triggers are the parts of the model that deviate the most from the real world object. Even though the high res model is a scan, there is some level of error in the capturing process. Couple that with the noisy capture and it does get tricky at points trying to figure out where each part ends and another one begins. My version of the switch's triggers are slightly longer than the real object. For me, it doesn't really matter, but if you're trying to be as faithful as possible to the real object, it might be a good idea to have it close by and measure things every now and then. The inner parts of the triggers, the ones socketed into the controller, also have nothing to do with the real thing, but who cares? I'm not planning to use this for manufacturing purposes, so it's fine. The last thing I would like to show you here is the modeling process for the D-pad. From a first glimpse, it might look like it's a simple extruded shape, but it's not. The real thing has a slight curvature in it. To get that, I used the Spherify Deformer. I first uh, grabbed the area with a polygon pen, I remeshed it, and then I used a really low value in Spherify settings. At the beginning, I went a little bit wild uh, with the values, giving the D-pad a very curved effect, but in reality, it's very subtle. Thankfully, having the reference close by and the scan right there in the viewport helped me tone down the effect to more normal levels. But I see the danger if you don't have a reference. You can easily go overboard with your stylistic choices. But apart from that, the rest of the shape is easy. It's just an extrusion and a bevel deformer. Nowadays, we have so many great tools at our disposal. Polygon pen, remeshing tools, insane polygon counts, even things like the placement tool help a ton with modeling. You can just grab your object and it will automatically snap to whatever surface you place it on. If I had modeled this controller in the 90s when I first started out with 3D, I wouldn't know where to begin. Would I be able to get there? Maybe yes, but the process would be a huge pain in the butt and I wouldn't be able to get this close to the real thing. Imagine trying to model this in a Cinema 4D version 2 or 3. That would be pure insanity and I'm definitely not gonna try that anytime soon. Anyway, let me know if you have any questions in the comments below and also don't forget to visit my Patreon page if you want to play around with the model. Take care and I'll see you on the next one.